The person who was uh, responsible for the recognition of this disorder was Dr. David W. Smith, who um, at the time of this recognition uh, was a professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington, and I was lucky enough to be his fellow at that time. And uh, one day, Dave had been um, asked to come down to the King County Hospital uh, to evaluate eight children uh, who had been prenatally exposed to alcohol. And it turned out that um, about five years prior to that, a pediatric resident by the name of Christy Euland uh, had been on call one night at the King County Hospital, and she was approached by an obstetric resident uh, who asked her what she knew about the effects of alcohol on the developing fetus. And Christy said, not much. And he said, well, you better find out soon because I'm about to go and deliver a baby who, was, who is being born to a woman who has a serious problem with alcohol. And she found out that, um, that um, in the obstetric textbooks uh, of the time and other literature that she rapidly looked through that uh, it suggested that alcohol was good for the developing uh, baby. She asked Dave Smith uh, to come down to look at those babies. Um, and I was his fellow, so I went along with him. And there were eight children there, eight of these 12 children. And we went from one to the next to the next to the next, examining them. And four of them, in addition to being growth deficient and having intellectual disability, four of them had this very specific pattern of malformation that has come to be known as the fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, I, I will tell you, we got back into Dave's car uh, to go back to his office at the University of Washington. He looked at me, he said, Ken, what do, you, what do you think of this? And I said, not much, Dave, what do you think? And he said, well, uh, Ken, this is the most important thing I've ever seen, and I suspect it's the most important thing you'll ever see as well. And he was uh, quite correct. Uh, we went back to his office and we looked through his unknown file, and we found two children who had the same features that the four children we had seen uh, that morning uh, had in his unknown files of thousands of children uh, who he had seen over the years in which he did not know the diagnosis. And when we look, went back to look at their mother's charts, uh, we found that the, those two children both their mothers were both chronic alcoholics. So in a period of about four hours that morning, we saw or became aware of six children, all of whom uh, looked alike, uh, all of whom were development, developmentally delayed, and all of whom were born to alcoholic women. The next day, or the next week, Dave went off to be um, the visiting professor at a, in the Department of Pediatrics at a university in the Midwest, and he saw a seventh child who had the fetal alcohol, had these same features, and while he was away, I saw the eighth child with this disorder, and that represents the eight children that we initially described um, in June of 1973 in the Lancet with, um, with this disorder. So there are countless genetic conditions that have the name of the person who initially described it as the name of that disorder, despite the fact that we now know the ideology of that disorder. Um, but the name of the individual has been the name of the disorder. Um, David Smith and I didn't think that was the right way to go as far as this condition is concerned. And so we named the condition for what caused the condition. And so we named it fetal alcohol syndrome because um, it was something in which alcohol affected the fetus. And so that's why we named it fetal alcohol syndrome. So we've gotten a, a lot of uh, criticism actually um, about that um, in uh, retrospect because I think people feel that it stigmatizes children. And that I think is a fair criticism. Um, I think that at the present time it's not going to change uh, because it's too, become uh, too much ensconced into um, the medical literature and our medical lexicon and how we talk about disorders. The, the first time I really talked about this uh, disorder was at the uh, Society for Pediatric Research meetings in uh, San Francisco um, in uh, the spring of 1973. And I gave a talk at the plenary session, and there were 
uh, well over a thousand pediatricians in the audience and the second I finished talking, uh, hands went up all throughout the audience and um, uh, not a soul who had a question uh, believed a word I had said. And um, the reason uh, why all of them didn't believe it was uh, perfectly understandable, um, and that was that women have been drinking alcohol uh, for centuries during their pregnancy, and if this disorder was really due to alcohol, if this was real, um, there would, um, this disorder would have been recognized long before. And of course, it had been recognized long before uh, because there are many references to this in the old literature. There's references in the Bible uh, to the fact that you shouldn't drink during pregnancy and, and basically why you shouldn't drink during pregnancy. So obviously this disorder has been known about uh, for years. Um, in, in fact, uh, Paul Lemoyne of uh, France described uh, almost identical um, um, uh, children with almost identical uh, problems uh, in a paper he published in 1968 in France. But as he said to me in a letter that he wrote me in 1973, my French colleagues did not believe me um, at, this, at that point and they do not believe me uh, to this day. So the disorder has clearly been around for quite a while, but the initial reaction uh, in the United States and previously the initial reaction in France was no, this, is, uh, this could not be a real problem. Basic scientists who worked with animals started doing studies on it and showing uh, similar kinds of problems in, in animals uh, um, who were given alcohol during pregnancy and, and then uh, about the same time large epidemiologic studies started uh, being uh, started being published that uh, showed that this uh, condition was real.